Hello and welcome to the Bob Reeves Brass Live Q&A with David Elton. I'm your host, John Snell. I hope you are safe and healthy wherever you are around the world. I uh, want to make a quick note to thank you for all the messages we've received since the shop has been closed. Uh, March 18th was when we shut down for COVID-19 and we've received a lot of messages. Uh, Bob Reeves and all of our staff are safe and healthy at home. And good news, we just received word from the state of California that we can slowly start reopening as of next week. So stay tuned for more updates. Uh, show us some love in the comments and uh, be sure to ask your questions because my special guest today is David Elton. He's the principal trumpet of the London Symphony Orchestra and the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. And he was recently featured on our podcast, The Other Side of the Bell. So uh, go ahead and ask your questions and let's bring uh, David in here. David, hey, how's it going? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great, John. Hi. Oh, How are you? Oh, man, you look like you're in a much better place than I am. You're in my <laughs> my bedroom corner. Oh, beautiful. Uh, oh. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's nice to be here. So uh, first things first, how are you doing? Are you staying safe and healthy and uh, all that stuff during these crazy times? Yeah, things are seem they seem to be relaxing a little bit now, and uh, we're less confined these days. We can go out and exercise. We can get around, and do things like that. So it's it seems to be slowly getting control of things. Hopefully, here in Australia, at least at the moment, which is where I am. Wonderful. Yeah, it's coming in loud and clear. So uh, awesome. Let's get to the first questions. Uh, this one comes from Javi. Uh, he wants to know what things did you do to develop your sound. Ah, okay. Um, I guess we're always developing our sound, aren't we? Mm -hmm. But um, I think a sound is such a thing. It, it comes from your head b before it comes from anywhere else. It's um, So I guess to answer that question, it would have to be, I listened a lot to sounds that I loved and thought about those sounds, you know, and, and I suppose when I was a student, mimicked them, tried to copy them, tried to copy what I liked about them. But then very much I thought about and I think still about now, uh, always being resonant, always having a ringing sound. And I think if that's what I wanted to have, it's pretty much mostly that. So every day, I guess, in my warm up, that's a, sort of my primary concern. It, it, for, for us as a trumpet player, I think the sound is absolutely which the thing that tells us about the health of our playing. So immediately I'm listening to the sound, trying to create the sound that I want um, and hopefully getting those results. But by doing that also, I can tell what my physical state is that day and what I need to do to get it to where I want to be. But yeah, resonance, poo attacks, as I said in another thing, soft, soft playing, loud playing, yeah. usual stuff. And actually that brings up a follow up from your from your podcast episode about the poo attacks and doing the Clark. So could you could you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, I guess I brought that in because it comes to the same sort of thing. As I said to uh, in the podcast, mm -hmm. when someone asked about the warm up, I do that most days to begin the practice. And that's obviously a poo attack. If you say poo, mm -hmm. you can see your lips begin together and they and they explode as, as some sort of an articulation that happens, but without using the tongue. So if you get a clear poo attack, it means your lips are together and in a good shape to play. And then... um doing Clark one very softly getting the resonance without with minimal effort so it's costing you nothing to play so you're you're playing with the minimum amount of effort minimum amount of cost but getting the sound to be ringing and then you can pay attention to the way your note finishes and I like to think about it as if I'm ringing a big church bell you hit the bell and you let the sound ring you can't make you can't make a big bell ring any louder by by banging it harder can you you have to you have to leave it to ring so that's pretty much what I like to try and think about when I'm beginning and, and, and take that through the day with me Great advice, great advice. And just uh, by way of logis logistics, because we're trying to coordinate this, uh, you're down in Australia right now. Um, so is that, is that the ocean behind you? <laughs> it is actually. I, it was such a beautiful morning okay. this morning, and I had to come out for a swim. So I'm down here by the beach doing the podcast, and then I'm about to jump in the ocean. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, so if you hear uh, the waves in the background, it's we're doing a little zen uh, relaxation and trumpet talk today. So for those of you viewing around the world, uh, we already have someone in Hawaii, I've noticed. Brian, hey, buddy. Uh, so already a worldwide audience so this is awesome and then also david if you, if you could just scoot back a little bit from the camera there we go uh there Thank we go so much. perfect Thanks, perfect John. yeah um okay let's get to the next question there are a bunch of them rolling in already uh andrew best advice from a teacher you still use today ah i mean there's so much isn't there mm -hmm. i think we go through our lives as musicians remembering the things we've taught and, and the, the things that people said to us. Um, 
I can um, one flashes to my head, of course, but I just want to think before I release it because it's it's one it's it's a very simple one, but I find myself thinking it it often. Um, but there, yeah, there's so much advice. Um, Is there any one couple? Any one that particularly stands out to you? Yeah, because I guess one's technical and one's just. Um, I mean, it's, there's just so much advice we also get without people saying it, isn't there? We get advice by the way people act, by the way they behave, by the way they relate, relate, with, uh, re- relate with other people and do things like that. So I guess one piece of advice I've observed from so many great players is just being calm and you know treating your colleagues well and being someone that's good to be around. So observing that, and uh, that's very much the ethos of the guys, ethos of the guys that I work with in London and, and here in Sydney, of course. But I think the, uh, on a technical standpoint, one that always comes back to me and I often think about is, I remember my teacher, and it was Yoram Levy, who I'm fortunate to t- still teach with now in Melbourne, um, alongside now at, at the Australian National Academy of Music. But he said to me once, tonguing is to be done with the tongue, not with the chest. Or as if you say, tonguing is only the tongue. So everything else in the body is really free and relaxed and that the tongue is what, what to do in the articulation. So I, I often think about that one because we can bring in so much unnecessary tension at times. And so that's one that pops into my head and I find myself repeating from time to time. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that's a great one. Great, great piece of advice. We have Maine checking in. We have uh, the Netherlands checking in. So uh, let us know in the comments where you're viewing from. And of course, if you have any uh, questions for David Elton, we'll try to get to them here. Uh, the next one comes from Francisco. Uh, what advice would you give to a new trumpet student, maybe in a first lesson or first year of teaching? Yeah, it might be the that's same great- thing. I don't know. That's a great question. I think probably to create a habit of breathing really well, because if you start with a great breath, then you're, you're already half the way there. So really good breath and really easy production and just try to minimize any excess effort. Try and find the most easy way to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great advice. Uh, the next question comes from John Haney, buddy of mine. Hey, John, how's it going? Uh, he had a friend study with you and felt like something you said that was a huge breakthrough in the practice room with, was thinking of tall notes. How do you implement okay. these? Well, first of all, what are tall notes and how do you implement these thoughts in your practicing teaching? Well, I'm I'm not po- I'm I'm not positive that was me because I can't remember ever saying that. And so um <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to take the credit for being a good teacher, but as soon as you said that, I thought maybe that's not me. Um I if I if I'm honest, I tall notes, I don't know what I might have been talking about if I was talking about that at that stage. It's not something that I would have said all the time probably. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I can't answer that. I'm really sorry. <laughs> well, sorry for about, sorry about that, John. We tried. Um, okay, so the next question um, is about your um, your warm up. What is your basic warm up? Do you have something that you do every day, or does it change depending on your day? It it, it totally changes depending on the day. I mean, there's times when we're we're touring a lot, and you can't do the the nice warm up you'd like to do. You have to just do pretty much get off the plane, go to the hall, do a fast warm up, quick rehearsal, and then there's the concert. And you, you can do that. So you've got to be able to do anything. I think you have to be um, variable and adaptable with your warm all the time. Um, but if I do have time and I have the chance and it, it's more like a routine or what I might consider rather than a warm up, I'm trying to think of things as a habit creation, you know, a habit session. You know, if I think about what habits I want to create today. And that is, of course, as I've said about nine times already, playing easily, playing efficiently and playing with minimum effort. So I will do those poor attacks we talked about in Clark one extensively some bending notes I do do buzzing um, and I go through stages of not buzzing and buzzing my mouthpiece but I I find it helpful at times and then there's times when I just don't do it uh, then I might do a stamp routine or something like that or some other sort of flexibility that can be very provided you've got the soft attacks and the soft playing and the resonance happening and a little bit of bending you it doesn't matter for me which flexibility or what which exercise I use to align all the notes and all, all the harmonics together um, that's really what that sort of stamp or flexibility thing might be for, always with sound in mind. And then, of course, I have to maintain my articulation all the time. So some articulation, some fast single tonguing, some multiple tonguing, and then some scale work because the other thing I always have to maintain and work on is my fingers. So if I hit those sort of three areas of sound quality, resonance, and flexibility, articulation, and then fingers, in some capacity, they're sort of the boxes I need to tick in. And, I'll take them in some way and often with varying methods. All right. Yeah. So let's, can we talk a little, how long does that take you normally? I mean, do you have like a 10 minute warm up when you need to get ready to go or is there, is that something that takes you an hour or so? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I can do it very, very quickly if I need to. And mm-hmm. and that, cha- that, that changes from day to day, doesn't it? You, we, I think we all know there's days where you pick up the trumpet and you're like, great, I'm having a great day. And there's days where you pick up the trumpet and say, wow, this is going to be a tough day today. So I think the first thing I, I would like to do is probably take the time to see where I'm at with the day. So I can do it fast, but often a 45 minutes or something like that is about how much I'll allow for that. And if you're not in a rush, I think you can do it so much better. If you're not hounding the clock and you're thinking about what you want to do and how efficiently you can do it, taking that extra bit of time, then it actually becomes really beneficial because you can create really proper habits that are going to stay with you. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Next question comes from Kate. Uh, She asks, what is your audition preparation technique and are there differences between the London and symphony auditions? Okay. Um, If if I work backwards, (laughs) there are the, oh, I think the auditions are pretty much the same wherever you go in the world. You're going to have to stand up and you're going to play in front of a panel or in front of the orchestra in some cases or in front of a small panel or the brass section uh, in, in the music director or something like that. But the size of panels can vary. Um, and so in London, I, I auditioned on the stage of the Barbican for a panel of brass players. And, um, and then you're put forward in a London orchestra or a British orchestra often to a trial period which can be very very extensive and they might have a few people trialing for the same job and they can go for several years and so by that you actually play in the orchestra you play with the conductors you do concerts and people can access how you might actually perform in the job or how you do the job and how you fit in with the brass section sound wise and also personality wise um, in Australia or in America as, as, which is where I studied the audition system is very much like there's a winner on the day you, you go in everyone's there on the day and you play the audition and someone wins or a couple of people win them and they have a shorter trial period perhaps and then you know a, you know six months a defined trial period rather than a, an undefined one so that's the slight difference with auditions as far as preparing for them I'd probably prefer prepare for them in a similar way uh, by being firstly in really good shape having my playing very efficient very easy and maintaining its balance so not just as I probably used to do when I was a student practicing my excerpts like crazy thinking yeah I've got a great Petrushka but you know not. so making sure the flexibility every aspect of my playing is in good shape I practice the excerpts I practice performing them I practice performing them in rounds so that you get used to playing them back to back back and probably the biggest thing that's still I mean, this has been what's so great about this time now when we've got a little bit more time is recording yourself. And I think we've seen so many musicians recording themselves more. But of course, preparing for an audition, recording yourself is paramount. And and listening back to it as if you're on the panel saying, what would you notice? What would you do? And of course, not only once you've done that, then you play for your friends and you get their feedback and you try and refine it. But that's the actual practice of performing and, and actually taking an audition that could be beneficial, I think is really important. Great advice. And okay, kind of what you touched on about what we're able to do during these times. This, uh, this question comes from Mike uh, over in the Netherlands. Uh, so how do you stay motivated during the corona crisis, uh, and especially without live performances? What do you, how do you mentally prepare, and what do you do? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I've, I've found this period quite um, helpful, actually. I think because probably we've, we've gone through such a long period of spending so much time touring, um, you know, we're always often away with the London Symphony and, and on you know, different tours here. We're actually supposed to be away right now. And then often going straight back into weeks with the Sydney Symphony when I have weeks off. So it, it was, it's was it been quite an intense few years of kind of working hard all the time. So to stop performances for a while, I haven't minded. It seems like it's been a nice a nice break. And it's been a time to really refine these, these some of these ideas. And I found it really easy to practice because there's so much solo stuff that I haven't been able to do and there's so many etudes and you hear you hear the students that you teach playing these great etudes and they have the time to work on them and they sound incredible these solo pieces and that's been sort of a nice focus for me through this time to be able to work on my solo repertoire work on my etudes refine these ideas find that ease of playing again and i found it great just to be able to do practice from day to day so yeah yeah you gotta stay inspired and yeah you, you have times especially with you when you're traveling and stuff uh, having not to fly places and whatnot, uh, probably yeah, you can work on projects and things that you didn't have to before. I <laughs> didn't have a chance to before. Yeah, so, that's really nice. Um, wonderful. Uh, so let's try. Oh, John Haney's trying again uh, with another question. So no, no tall notes this time. Uh, how do you practice the piccolo trumpet uh, to play some of the larger repertoire uh, for endurance and uh, endurance specifically? Yeah, okay. So think about the, I'm just trying to think what the big endurance pieces for piccolo trumpet might be. They might be some of the pieces by Messian, I suppose, where you've got these, a rite of spring or something like that. 
I'm trying to think what's more taxing than that for piccolo. I'm sure there's plenty. I mean, I think the solo repertoire in some ways is for piccolo trumpet is actually more taxing than the orchestral repertoire. So I don't know if John's asking about the solo repertoire or the orchestral repertoire. I guess in the orchestra, you need to play the piccolo quite loudly uh, or not loudly, but it has to sail over the top. So it's not like playing a Baroque Telemann concerto where you might be able to float it over a harpsichord and a string. So it's a different, slightly different way of playing. Um, I practice the piccolo trumpet by practicing solo pieces and keeping my range in good shape on the B flat trumpet and then doing piccolo as, as I need to and just maintaining it through solo stuff. Kind of the orchestra stuff, if you play efficiently, piccolo is going to sit there and it's mostly going to come out anyway. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think bolero, bolero is another one that I suppose you have to, I'd probably practice that a little bit just to make sure you've got the endurance to, because there's a lot of that sitting around, isn't it? Things like the first entry in Messi and you've sat for a long time and you've got to smack in on something. So I'd probably practice that a bit. Being so, warmed up. Uh, in yeah. the comments section, we got mentioned, uh, how about like Bach, things like the Christmas Oratorio, Magnificat, things like that? Right, yeah, so, well, like, that's a, that's, that makes a lot of sense. That's the sort of repertoire I don't play so much in the orchestra because we play in, you know, the symphony plays, the, the big repertoire. And in some ways, those Bach pieces, while I've done them in smaller orchestras over the years and in, in, in regional towns and in, in, you know, scratch groups that are playing for a group, I, um, don't play them from day to day now, especially, you know, with the traditions of being rock trumpet and that sort of stuff these days are becoming quite popular. Mm -hmm. uh, but doing that stuff, I, yeah, that's credo and things like that. I mean, that was on my LSO edition. You have to still be able to play those pieces. And again, I come back to playing solo rep repertoire and practicing those pieces. But again, it comes right back to, if I think about actually how I would practice the credo or how I would practice some of those Magnificats, I do it exactly like I said at the start of the the podcast try to find a way to do it as efficiently and, and as easily as possible even if that's breaking it down so then it becomes so rather than thinking about endurance and strength i think more about efficiency so then it's less tiring it's, if i make my focus that then i can find endurance through that hmm. as an ideal whether it works or not i don't know awesome yeah. Great, great. Thank you, John, for that question. Uh, and we are here live with David Elton, principal trumpet of the London Symphony Orchestra and the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. And uh, he's joining us from the beach, so you'll hear the waves in the background and uh, very relaxing for all of us. I uh, wish I could put on my Bermuda shorts and kick back for a little bit. <laughs> um, so show us some love in the comments. Show us where you're watching from around the world. It's exciting for us to see uh, where you're watching. Uh, we already have Hawaii, obviously Australia. I saw Japan in there. Um, Maine uh, on the other side east coast so let us know in the comments and uh, of course if you have any questions we'll try to get to them before we wrap up here so the next question comes from Francisco uh, how do you manage playing loud passages you know being principal trumpet especially uh, without forcing the sound ah uh, I just think it's 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 what you practice from the beginning of your warm-up if you've practiced playing efficiently and leaving the sound ringing the more you, you get louder and louder and louder, the more you, 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 you leave the sound ringing. And you, I think you do it by listening to the sound you're creating. And if you press on the sound, you can hear when you've, you've shut it down and, you, and you're forcing a little bit at the sounds of the guide. So just getting used to it. And I think those things you, you also learn by doing it. Often when you're working with a young student, you think, well, that doesn't project very much. But until you actually sit there and have to do it, you, you don't work it out. Do you know what I mean? So you, part of it comes by doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And the next question comes from Javi. Uh, which etude books do you uh, work on more or less regularly? Okay, that's that's a great question for these times because, of course, as I said, it's it's etude time. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point because there's, it's always about having a balance, isn't it? Um, my favorites, I would say, to uh, Longinotti is a great book that my teacher, Charlie Guy, first showed me when I was a student in Northwestern. And it's a comeback to book because it's fun to play. They're really beneficial. They're very varied. Um, I like doing them. I like doing the Chalier. I think all trumpet players love doing the Chalier book. I like the Biche etudes as well, a little bit more tricky and uh, challenging. I like Bousquet. That's very much one of the ones I might do during the week just to stay flexible and in focus for articulation and sort of writing on the air in a cornet sort of style. And when I'm feeling good and have more time or one of the big challenge at the top tone book by Walter Smith is a great one. And they're the kind of the ones that, that would pop out. And we've been setting a few Saxa etudes as well for the Annam class in the last few weeks. So that's been in there as well. And of course, the Arben ones at the back of the characteristic studies, they're quite fun to play. And they're a good one for strength. <laughs> quite a list. Quite a list. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite? 
Do you have like book? a do you have a go to? Yeah, know? Longinotti. Yeah, Longinotti. You could play that book through if you want. Uh, Longinotti or Charlie? Yeah, they're probably on the stand the whole time. Yeah. Hugh yeah. Dan from New Zealand. Hey, he's watching. Hey. How you doing, buddy? Hey, hey, Hugh. Nice <laughs> uh, to see you. Who have you listened to most to shape your own sound, and who are you listening to now? Oh, that's a nice question. Thanks, Hugh, for the question. Um, I think it's fair to say, as as growing up, my favorite player, the person that I modeled and dreamt of sounding like and could copied was probably Philip Smith. I love that sound. You know, I, I think we all had that orchestral excerpts CD that came out in the 1990s. I I've worn out a few. And so I listened to that, that CD and then all his recordings, all the New York Philharmonic, he, his sound, the way it rang, the way it vibrated, the, the brilliance level to it was for me just the, the, the pinnacle sound. But of course, I mean, growing up when I did, I listened to Bud Herseth was another huge favorite. So I was massively influenced by the American trumpet sound. Of course, Morris Murphy, another one of those incredible, radiant, brilliant, exciting sounds. Um, the other huge inspiration is probably Hulkan Hardenberger. I love his playing every aspect of it, the soloistic character, the sound, the articulation. So they're kind of my thinking about that straight away. The, the sounds that I would probably have most listened to and still do to con- continue to this day. I mean, obviously you balance it as well with some of the, um, for Brahms and Bruckner and some of those German recordings with a nice sound like that there's plenty of beautiful sounds from some of those orchestras over there and you can think of Hans Garch as another incredible sound from a little bit earlier than that um but yeah so I'm list I listened to them a lot right now I'm listening to Clifford Brown and I listen to a bit of pop music some other things like that but trumpet wise yeah there's lots of so much great playing going around at the moment even on the internet it's a new medium we're seeing you don't need to go dig out a cd don't you people are presenting things from their lounge rooms and that's very very exciting so just seeing what people are doing is, is great at the moment. Uh, any any projects that you're working on right now? Any recordings right. or super secret things you can tell us about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to keep working on those. So, I mean, we talked about it about a month ago now or a few weeks ago when the podcast was. Mm-hmm. I'm still working on those solo pieces, and I yeah, hope to, to get, get together a performance. We're trying to perform each Saturday for a couple of friends and um, get this sort of thing going where you, you just practice performing and getting solo stuff, getting it more consistent. And so hopefully some of that maybe at some stage awesome and i'll take a moment to plug uh, the podcast uh, episode 77 with david elton uh so you can listen i think we went about an hour so um it's available on spotify google Podcasts, apple Podcasts, also on our website bobreeves.com so be sure to uh, check out the full episode uh, interview that we did a few weeks ago it was it was awesome to chat so um show us love in the comments we are live with david elton a- answering your questions here on facebook and the next one comes from Zach. Zach McIntyre asks, how do you work on keeping a relaxed tongue but maintain a clean articulation? Whew, yeah, I want to know this one too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all want to know that yeah. one. Um, that's a good good point. You got me think about that. How do you... I guess, the, yeah, the, you, you always want to go faster, don't you? You always want to have a fast single tongue, but you want to have a clean articulation. So for clarity, I work out of the album book and have a sort of a routine that gives me a very very clear t articulation something that sounds brilliant and, and precise and i think it's about the tongue going very fast through the airstream and not interrupting it too much so thinking about that first for the clarity and then keep going fast by doing simple you know like in the stamp book it's even got those um those etudes with just repeated tongue studies in it so just doing short fast bursts and then um, sometimes even I go to the double tonguing if it's getting a bit slow and I need to get it fast. I'll go to the double tonguing section of the album, and I'll do a double tongue and then single tongue and repeat. So you, you 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 take your single tongue to the double, and so then you're practicing two things at once as well. So that's that's something I keep it fast. And then just paying attention to it. I guess it's like anything we do. We've got to observe what's happening, and if it gets tight, find a way to release it and relax a little bit and take a moment, take a break and come back to it uh you do well prior to the COVID 19 uh, you did do a lot of traveling and not just a hopping across to perth or something you're flying halfway around the world (laughs) how physically how do you stay in such good shape you know not just trumpet playing i mean is that obviously intentional what what do you do no no we were just trying to think about being in physical good shape um I try, I mean, like, like anything, we're, none of us are getting any younger, so I have to, I try to go for a run now and then if I can. I mean, 
I think running is as much for your mind as it is for your body, isn't it? So you just to get out, like being out even right now in the fresh air, I'm jumping in the ocean. I'm a bit addicted to cold water, so just jumping in the ocean, things like that. I'll always try and find a way if I travel to. I mean, that's the thing. It's we have a group of us in the in the London Symphony. If we go somewhere, if we, we get to Heathrow at seven in the morning, we might go to Spain. We'll go for a run as soon as we land, jump straight in the ocean if we're if, in a place by a beach or something like that, and then have lunch and then quick nap and then off to rehearsal, uh, something like that if possible. But so you just take the opportunities where you are to to see something, and that's so that keeps you fit in itself, doesn't it? Or keeps you in shape. Oh, yep. Got to got to still stay active, and uh, <laughs> that's wonderful advice. Especially as trumpet players tend to, uh, you know, not want to do those kinds of things. So it's uh, it's very well, it's, inspiring. Um, it's nice for your lungs, though, don't you think? Even if you go for a run, it really feels like you opened up and kind of wakes you up before you even begin practicing. So it's a kind of a nice thing to do. And it's, um, I think all trumpet players we like beers as well. So you're uh, drinking your beer. So if you drink a beer, you're going to go for a run sometimes to keep it all in balance, if possible. <laughs> Oh, look who joined us. We have Simon Sweeney. He's uh, Hey, Simon. <laughs> how you doing, buddy? Uh, we need to have Simon on here sometime. I'm uh, trying to trying to get him to join in. So here, now, no pressure now, Simon, now that I've mentioned you live. So we'll, we'll have to I'd chat. To that, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things, and I hate to say controversial, but I mean, it seems like a kind of a black and white thing with buzzing and no buzzing in terms of the mouthpiece. And you mentioned you do it sometimes and sometimes mm. you don't do it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you do and integrate uh the buzzing the mouthpiece into your routines but then also uh when you think you've either done it too much or when it's not going for you yeah for sure i mean there's a lot of people there's people that definitely say absolutely no buzzing that they don't and then there's great players and some of my as i said to you my favorite players that i i've modeled stuff on over the years buzz every day and so um when I do do buzzing, which is actually probably more than, than not, and I have over the years, I've done, as a student, I did the Thompson book, which I found very, very helpful at the time, and working with Jim Thompson was really, really good. And so I think that's called the buzzing book now, but at the time it was called Buzzing Basics for all you guys that remember that as well. So I found that really good. I do think being able to buzz with a burp or a, some sort of buzz resistance pipe or something like that is extremely helpful if you're playing etudes. So you could do very short I might just play, you know, Shalia 2 or some study like that where you have to pitch everything and just make sure that's all lined up so I can buzz all of that. And not necessarily the whole thing is a physical exercise, but a line so that's really in tune. And then I might play it on the trumpet. So going back and forth between the two, I think, can be really, really beneficial. But the bit that I sometimes do and don't do is the bit in the stamp book. And that is, um, you know, buzzing that and then going diatonically through that on the modal series to buzzing up to a high C constant pitch. So I, I will do that and then buzzing down to the pedal notes. I will do that two or three times a week. And often if it's if I don't do it it's just because, you know, time's short or I don't feel like it or I can't be bothered. And I don't to be honest, notice a huge difference either way. If I'm if I feel like I want to get back in shape and I want to be a bit stronger then I might do that. But if I if it's feeling good and I I haven't worked out if it's better or or worse without yet but go through stages yeah awesome okay next question comes from andrew thoughts on recovery from daily practice or touring so you're able to build day after day and also i might tack onto that what do you do also on a like if you're having a bad day so i'll tack that yeah. on to the end of that question yeah i know about that <laughs> um i guess i recovery is really key isn't it and as a student I remember always feeling tired I always wake, woke up in the morning feeling fatigued and I thought oh this is hard and I had to spend a lot more time. I, honestly I, I probably practiced too much when I was a student quite often and so I think firstly one of the key things you can do is not practice too late at night if that's possible for you if you're going to practice in the morning then try not to practice till 10 o'clock at night and or, or smash yourself because then you're going to just pull up stiff and, and swollen and it's going to be hard work in the morning so rest is really really important and if you are you do overdo it don't be afraid i don't think to take a day off however there's another thing that i found enormously helpful and it's the book by michael Sachs. i think it's called daily fundamentals for trumpet yeah. it's published by imc i bought that book when it came out and i love it and at the back of that book somewhere in the warm-up section is a page that says warm down exercises and I love that he says, just like an athlete who's run a, a, a fast race or a sprint race, you've got to take care of your chops and you've got to warm down afterwards. So sometimes I will do that page. I put the metronome on 60 and because, you know, you, you, you finish a long day, you've practiced a lot. You don't really feel like warming down. But if I 
you know, I can put a stopwatch timer and say, okay, I'm just going to do this for eight minutes or seven minutes and then I'm going to drink a beer or something like that and then I'm, then I'm finished for the day and can have dinner or whatever. But I will do that with a metronome on, rest as much as I play and it's a simple something like that and then a little rest and then going through. That makes me feel 500 times better when I pick it up in the morning as if I've warmed up already for half an hour. So if I'm feeling tired or I need to do recovery, that page of really simple things, it's low tonguing, it's... um down to the pedals at the end but even at the end of that page i feel like i could play again so that's that's really actually secretly not that secretly what i do to <laughs> to warm down or if you've had a really really big concert and you've got to do it again in the morning then i might do that because i know that's going to make it feel so much easier starting in the morning and just save so much warm-up time great we are here live with david elton principal trumpet of the london symphony and the sydney symphony orchestras and uh go ahead and ask your questions down in the comments show us some love and put where you're watching from it is so great to see from all over the world well obviously australia because that's what we're talking to right now la uh, we had the east coast we had europe checking in i saw japan check in so let us know where you're watching from and if you have any questions for David, fire them away in the comments section. Uh, Simon, uh-oh. Oh, hello from sunny Glendale. Noah, right down the street from me. So, so <laughs> awesome. Simon, Simon Sweeney is asking advice on soft playing. We, we talked about loud playing earlier without forcing. Uh, so any advice on soft playing production practice for us mere mortals? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, Simon and I were working together just the other week, so uh, it was a real... Real pleasure. He comes in and plays a lot of the big um, pop shows with us and things like that, which is just wonderful to have him around. And, and he is not a mere mortal, let me tell you. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I'm. That's exactly what I'm getting to. A very, a, very yeah, humble absolutely. question. <laughs> yeah. Um, for soft playing, it's as I said to you. Um, I really like the the Clark one softly. I like doing flexibility, Charles Colin softly, because if you have the response, it's really good. But even if you do the the first page of um, the Sloshberg book, just getting used to playing very very softly and down to where it doesn't respond I don't think you need to do a heap of it you can do a little bit of five minute practice a day it can really make a massive difference just keeping that response there but at a practice being able to play soft really well it affects it it makes your loud playing so much easier as well I think yeah but it's staying relaxed and staying free and enjoying playing soft as well all right, just we already had Sweden, Spain, and North Carolina check in, and Ralph Pyle. Man, I, us, all of Australia is waking up early to see you, uh, David. So this is awesome. Great to see all of our friends cool. down there. Good morning, guys. Um, I want to talk about something you touched on in our podcast interview about choice of horns, uh, because I know in the U.S. a lot of uh, orchestral trumpet players see trumpet as kind of their home base, uh, but of course in London, then they, you know, a lot of them use B flat more and then also the rotary piston thing so can you talk a little bit about that what your choice of trumpets is and how going mm -hmm. to london affected that yeah absolutely um there's a big tradition of b-flat trumpet in the uk firstly in great britain and then definitely in within london and also especially the london symphony which had that tradition of morris murphy and rod franks and phil cobb and continues that playing b-flat trumpet for everything and these guys are absolute monsters and it's a special sound it's a great sound that they can do that um, so I all grew as as I've talked in the podcast. I studied in Australia and then in the, in America. And I'm, as I said earlier, I was very influenced by the sound of Phil Smith and the American players, Bud Herseth and people like that. So I learned a lot of my excerpts and have performed most of these pieces on C trumpet before. So I still often, and you'll see it on some of the LSO videos, play C trumpet um, for some of the big repertoire. And generally speaking, that's probably my choice for playing in the orchestra, except for some Elgar pieces and some things like that, Shostakovich, etc. I don't mind playing rotary either um, myself, and sort of with having tradition tradition of that in Sydney, as I think the American orchestras do. You play your your Brahms and your Bruckner and Wagner, Beethoven, things like that. Potentially, um, maybe not Strauss or Mahler, but as they would in Germany. So I, I don't mind doing that at all, and actually, I very much like playing. Brahms on the on the rotary trumpet, and Simon Rattle has asked us in the London Symphony to do that <clears throat> for the three Bs, as he called it, um, with, as I mentioned before. But uh, yes, he's my choice. I do try, if possible, if I'm working with Phil, we're working alongside each other in London, try and play B flat trumpet, so we're we're lined up, where it's possible and comfortable for me too. I do as well. But they also said to me, look, um, when I was, I mean, I was on trial, so it was plenty of time to say. You would prefer if I played them before. I said, look, we actually don't mind what trumpet you play. What we care about is how you sound. And if you sound like it 
sound we want, then that's what matters. So in some ways, it doesn't really bother me what a trumpet, what trumpet a person plays. It's what you feel most comfortable with, with and what sort of sound you make. And you can do that on an e-trumpet. All right. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Um, how about, um, oops, I'm losing you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you great. Okay. Awesome. A little glitch here. Um, what about the, the, re- the recordings you've done with the LSO? Um, mm-hmm. what, uh, do you and Phil Cobb split up the, the principal parts or how does, how does that work? Generally what happens with, um, a, a, you know, a lot of these orchestras have two principals, like you think of Berlin and London and some of the other orchestras. It's dependent often on what we've got repertoire wise. Say if we go on a tour, so we're supposed to be in New York right now. So we were doing Bluebeard's Castle and Bartok Concerto, Concerto for Orchestra. And then there was of course a first half in each of those programs. So one of us decides which piece we're going to play. So I say, Phil, what do you want to play? And he goes, I don't know, Delvin, what do you want to play? And so we, we discuss that for a few months before we get to a, um, someone decides what they're going to do. <clears throat> and he's been always completely cool with what do you want to do? And we, we generally have to, to fight to see for the other person to decide what we're doing. So we, um, we decide on that and then split the programs like that. So often a piece will get recorded afterwards. So then whoever did that tour, you're often tied to that patch. So it depends if you're away doing something else or if I'm in town or whatever. So it's not actually something we, we there's so much repertoire that comes by so fast. We just literally work it out on the fly. Um, we sort of have a rough idea what you're doing in the next few months. So, and just another example is we did um, a tour last year to China, I think maybe even two years ago, where we did pictures in an exhibition and Shostakovich Chen was on the program and I said, Phil, what do you want to play? And he says, I don't know, what do you want to play? Um, and he, he, he doesn't really care because he's obviously been in the orchestra for already more over 10 years since he was 21. So Jeez. he doesn't mind. Well, yeah, so he's just like, you can play what you want. So um, I played the pictures on that program and he played the, it was the Shostakovich 10. And then, of course, I played the first half. We did alternate first halves. But then because of the London Symphony Orchestra, one of us will probably bump the other for the process of, because we're on tour, you want to play the concert and if you're there for the first half it's nice for the other players because you are being paid by service there you're not being paid a salary so you can't just oh great i've got the second half off i might just duck off to the pub we'll probably sit there and or go and have a nice dinner you'll, you'll sit there and so I'll, I'll play a few bits in shostakovich and on phil might you know play a few corners in just to help just to give it a lift at the end or something like that but it's more about being there and being supportive and and then you're also there if someone got sick so they always take two principles on tour you play one piece and that's actually ends up being what you what you record if you record that piece hmm. so, uh yeah is there, are there any uh ones any pieces that you know specifically that you played on that uh, we can reference that we know that's you playing on it <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um for in the lso there's yeah, yeah. i have to go off memory there's um schumann 2 came out recently with john Elliott Gardner. we've got the pictures in an exhibition and fills on that same disc playing the Tchaikovsky 4. I think that's the same disc. The Shostakovich 5, we're both on. I'm playing because I was on trial then and Phil's there playing a few, but he's bumping me in, the, in a few spots at the end of Shostakovich 5. There's the Shostakovich 8 that I did. There's the 10 that he did uh, um, of that tour. I'm trying to think what's come out. Verdi Requiem, Phil's playing off stage. I'm playing on stage in that one. Um, uh, I'm sure there's plenty more. They, they, we do LSO live so often. I just, I'll probably forget some of them as soon as I, I get off this. But they're, they're the ones that come to mind right away. Yeah. Um, so, and then the next thing I wanted to ask you was about um, when you're um, during your preparations for a tour. Like how there are obviously works you've played already. Um, is there any any preparation that goes into a tour? Because uh, you're playing usually big work, so what what does the rehearsal schedule for like an orchestra look like when you're doing things like that? Mm. Just trying to think about the last tour. Often you've got several pieces. This can be the thing you might be doing. I think we're at, uh, the Hong Kong tour last year we were doing Harmony Lyra, a Rachmaninoff two, and some other things. So often these pieces we've played a lot of times over the years. So we might have played Harmony Lyra at the beginning of the season, and then it might come back because Simon Rattle would have done it with us in April or something. And then we're going to take it away in July. So, um, yeah, so you, you might have played it before. It, it can be very short rehearsal. It can be touching it. You might play one concert in London, and then you might be at the airport the next day. And so in some ways, you, I wouldn't say the huge preparation. There's just touring's a, a part of life, and you, you just go ahead and do it. And pieces get better, I think, on tour. And it's really nice when you actually get back for, from a tour and you, you're playing a piece potentially slightly differently than mm-hmm. you might have done the one that was on the webcast or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, things develop by performances, so it's nice to see that. 
Uh, now we have time for about one or two more questions. So we're here live with David Elton of the uh, London Symphony Orchestra and the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. So show us some love in the comments and ask David anything. Again, we have time for one or two more questions. The next one coming in is about stage fright uh, and nerves. So uh, mm. one, do you have you dealt with uh, stage fright? And if so, uh, what's your advice on that? I think... I think every player has dealt with stage fright. Absolutely, um, no question. And it's it's still always something you've got to pay attention to, or you, you might want to deal with. I remember being very, very nervous as a student, and and you know I still get nervous if I've got an audition. And I can, we we get not in stage fright, but we get some sort of anxiety for different things, don't we? Sometimes even like thinking about coming on this podcast to talk to you, I got a bit bit of stage fright. <laughs> um, so I'm talking about no, you you, you me feel me too, me too. Yeah, yeah. You can observe what your body's doing or what 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 how why am I feeling a bit edgy today because is that something's coming up? So you can observe that in the distance as well as just being quite frankly, you know, I'm about to do Marla Five, and how do we um, what are we going to do about that? You know, like I've got to start. That's a different sort of thing. I have thought a lot about uh, and read a bit about those sort of things and and. And techniques involved that like if you haven't checked out the don i found don green's books mm -hmm. very very helpful he's an american um s sports coach who deals with musicians a lot and i think you know i'm very interested in what he's done and so his books and website are well worth worth checking out so a lot of the processes he's done talking about centering talking about those things i've uh, definitely worked with for auditions and still call upon you know when i'm performing now mm -hmm. so Con controlling your breathing and also it's your mental state making sure you mentally watch what you're telling yourself watch what you're thinking yeah i have to be careful of that <laughs> yeah wonderful and hey it uh, wouldn't be a trumpet podcast unless we asked uh talked about mouthpieces uh so andrew's asking uh did you make any changes with your equipment specifically the mouthpieces when you uh moved to london and from sydney no really no um I didn't actually because I was sort of I'm still playing between the two and and I actually keep the same sort of setup. I just play a and the normal normal a slightly bigger mouthpiece on my C trumpet which is a Park mouthpiece and I have a Toshi Japanese mouthpiece which I use on my B flat trumpet and I that works really well for soloistically on the C trumpet as well. And so I just sort of stick with those two and kind of most of the time it works. Uh, yeah. So stylistically, though, is there, is there a difference between the orchestras in terms of the sound and the <clears throat> the phrasing and such? Interpretation. Yeah, I, yes, there, there there is. Of course, there is. Um, I think there's a difference with every orchestra. Mm -hmm. Whether I, whether I analyze it like really specifically and break it down into words, I'm I'm not sure if I do. I think I just it's a feeling. It's where the play, it's the energy level, it's the the way the the brass respond, the braid, the brass attack. It's it's also that's dictated by the color of the orchestra, isn't it? How you how how you fit into that sound. So whether I, whether I analyze it, I don't know. There's definitely a good amount of front to the note in London, um, and you know, and you, you you take those things with your playing wherever you go. So it's always it's repertoire dependent as well as it's hard to give a broad generalization. Oh, they use way more attack here, or they play brighter here, or, or louder here. It's it's depending on the piece and depending on the the concert and depending on the conductor and depending on the hall and there's so many things so not a huge style thing and but it's it's about fitting into what's around you mm -hmm. yeah we talked about some of that on the podcast yeah. and yeah. oh man now it's we're talking about nerves my dad's watching hi dad <laughs> <laughs> he, he says thank you to us both uh so we're all uh, thank you dad <clears throat> it's too kind um and then, uh, so yeah, we talked about that on the podcast, and I remember some. And then also this next question comes from Johan. I know we talked about this, so, uh, but if you want to touch on it, how old were you when you started playing the trumpet, and what inspired you to become a professional trumpet player? Yeah, that's, it was nice to talk about that in the podcast. Um, I was nine years old when I began playing the trumpet, and I played violin before I played the trumpet. And I just think it was hearing the band in the street and then you know had him having a great teacher who played in the sydney symphony um, paul goodchild was my teacher and hearing him every few weeks as i got a little bit older and going to hear him play in the symphony became very inspiring that that's actually what i wanted to do with my life yeah great and then be sure to check out the other side of the bell uh episode 77 we did I, I think an hour of talking all, a lot of biographical stuff and then we touched on a bunch of other things uh and uh, so yeah Check that out, The Other Side of the Bell, on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, pretty much everywhere, I think, these days. <laughs> um, wonderful. So, well, uh, just the last question comes from me. David, uh, What? Where? how can folks find out more about you? What's the best way to follow you to 
uh, keep an eye on what you're up to, new projects and things like that? Oh, um, that doesn't. I mean, anyway, Instagram. I've got, I mean, I'm I'm on Instagram, and I've got a, a, a website, davidelton.com.au. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. you. That's sometimes up to date. And and you're also uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You're also available for online lessons as well. Yeah, there's been a new um a new uh for sort of platform emerged during this time. So a, a lot of my friends and um some great great musicians from around around the world are are on this site it's called eons a e y o n s dot com i mean it's online eons dot com i think mm-hmm. and there's um it seems to be a new platform i think it's a bit like play with a pro but it's um a different thing it's looking i'm looking forward to doing some some things there and seeing how that that develops awesome and we'll make sure we put we'll throw the link to that down in the comment section so folks can uh find it and then also uh we'll put it up in the description so people can find you and learn more about you and hopefully get a lesson from you because that would be awesome thanks John. <laughs> yeah this is so cool david uh thank you so much for uh for joining us and i hope you're uh stay safe and well and keep us up to date with what you're doing so